Our next speaker, his name is Steve Castle, and um, you may or may not know, but our company um, created a product where we package um, exotic wildlife animals into a partnership, and we facilitate people that don't own land um, and give them the ability to get involved in the industry. So um, as an example, the auction that we have tonight, the animals that are being sold are not animals that Chris and I own. These are animals that are actually the offspring um, that were produced by the breeding herds that these investors from around the United States own. And so we met Steve through the broker-dealer community, and he is... He is very unique when it comes to uh, the IRS and tax. Um, I have found that it's very difficult to find CPAs that have a really good um, foundation for tax strategy. There's lots of CPAs that are good at filing taxes and entering data into a tax software, but finding someone that's actually capable of creating strategies that, that help you to keep more of your money um, versus giving it to what he refers to as the largest parasite in America. Um, and I think that is the title of his presentation, the cash requirements and planning for the largest parasite in the U.S. And he is not talking about divorce lawyers. And so um, we're going to go ahead and, and bring Steve Castle up. And, and one thing I do want to say about Steve um, before, before you applaud him, um, he works with a lot of very, very sophisticated, very successful professionals, and he is exceptionally good at what he does. So if you are in the category of you have problems with uh, tax and you need somebody to help, talk to him. And if he doesn't have time to help you, I'm sure he can get you with someone that can, but he's, he's highly capable, highly intelligent, and he has the capability of doing some amazing things from a tax strategy standpoint. So with that said, Mr. Steve Castle. You want this or that? Thanks. Thanks, Brian, for the kind words. Um, there's picture of the parasite, but let me bring that a little bit more into focus until you see who it is. Um, you know, we all have to deal with it. Uh, this parasite's a little bit different than most of the other ones you're dealing with out in the field, because um, this one goes after your money. So they're not looking for red, they're looking for green. And obviously that's a big problem. Um, this is a little bit about me. Um, I'm going to skip it, doesn't matter. Uh, I, I like the ranching industry in general. Um, I've been doing CPA type work for about 30 years. Uh, started out at the IRS, um, was a field auditor for a number of years for high net worth individuals and closely held businesses. And one of the things I really like about ranching is there's no other industry out there where whatever you produce, you can turn around and sell and get capital gains treatment. You think about any other service industry, any other manufacturer, you have a product, you have equipment, you have whatever, you produce something and you turn around and sell it and Uncle Sam takes right now at least 37%. Your offspring, you hold them for a year and you're looking at long-term capital gains rate versus ordinary. That's a 45% decrease in tax. That is substantial. The other benefit of ranching is you don't have the Obamacare tax, the 3.8% that you get associated with real estate, with dividends, with interest. Uh, it's a great avenue to further cut your tax bill. And you'll see the last one, number three there, the ability to sell your offspring at much more favorable tax rates, at capital gains rate. And everybody always compares 20% versus 37. But if you really think about it, and that's what I'm here to enlighten you today, is there's capital gains rate as low as zero. There's capital gains at 15%. So if you think about how you can manipulate your books, your records, by changing the timing of what you do, you can considerably reduce your tax, therefore preserving your cash. 
Right there, you'll see the slide. This is pretty much old news for most of you. Long term is anything held more than a year. Short term is anything less than a year. Now, unfortunately, the market has not always been favorable the last year and a half. So even if you sell your livestock, you sell the offspring, you haven't had it for a year, you still have short-term short capital gains rate. And if you have those nagging uh, stock losses, bond losses, you can offset those losses, or those losses can offset the short-term gains you have on selling your livestock, even if you don't have it for a year. So there's certainly advantages to being in ranching. And as Brian alluded to, with the investments that they've uh, created for various individuals that don't have enough land to have their own exotics, it's a great avenue for some tax planning to reduce a tax bill. Uh, and, and let's face it, um, anything you can reduce to pay Uncle Sam is gonna be a benefit, right? I, I mean, it's money in your pocket. Um, you really don't get anything back when you pay your taxes. Uh, I know several individuals that have paid multi-million dollars. Um, they never get a thank you note. They never get an invitation to a dinner. Um, they never get a letter. There's no Christmas card. There's nothing. So, you know, what are you going to give away cash for nothing for? Um, that's kind of just something to take a look at. So I mentioned capital gains rate, 0, 15, and 20. Those are the current tax rates. Single HOA is head of household, and MF is married filing joint. And you'll see if you can get your taxable income under 89250 you actually pay zero tax on that capital gain. So if you're selling the offspring that you've had for more than a year, and that's the only income you have, you're at a 0% tax bracket. If you have married filing joint, $553,850. If your taxable income is less than that half a million dollar figure, your tax rate is 15%. Unfortunately, I sell a service. If I'm at a half a million bucks, my tax rate is not 15%. It's 37%. That is substantial. So when you think about this, and you start looking at what you're doing and comparing year after year and you guys do budgets and you know, gee, do I want to buy that equipment this year? Do I want to sell those animals this year? Think about the capital gains rate and what you're selling and what you're doing because it could significantly lower your tax burden. Depreciation has been around for over 100 years. 2017 allowed us to basically have bonus depreciation, which was allow you to write off whatever you bought in the first year, you got 100% depreciation for anything with less than a 15% or excuse me, 15 year life. So if you bought an exotic and you were going to breed it, you could have written it all off. 2022 was the last year of 100%. For 2023, this year, it's 80%. 2024, it's 60%. Depreciation is always timing. If you bought a tractor, five-year life, you spent a quarter million bucks, normally you would have depreciated that prior to 2017, over five years, more or less, we'll keep math simple, you get 50,000 a year. After 2017, you buy that Tractor for 250, you got a $250,000 write off. Awesome. Animals, same category. Everything less than a 15 year, but again, 2023, the 100% goes down to 80%. 24 goes from 80 to 60. So when you're doing your year end planning or when you're thinking about do I buy this, do I not buy it, that extra 20% might make the difference. And remember, this counts whether you buy it for cash or you finance it. So if you finance it, you still get the deduction. It doesn't make a difference. You just have to put it in service by the end of the year. Real quick example, 2022, let's assume you have income before 
depreciation of $100,000, you buy $250,000 of assets, could be animals, it could be equipment, doesn't make a difference. In 2022, you would have taken bonus depreciation on the 250, got a $250,000 write-off, would have offset your $100,000 of income, you would end up with a taxable loss of 150. For 2023, that same 250 would yield you a $200,000 immediate write-off. The remaining $50,000 gets written off over whatever that useful life is. I simply assumed five years and made math simple and said, okay, the extra 50 gets me 10. So in year 2023, I got 250. In year, sorry, in year 22, I got 250. In year 23, I get 210. Now, the extra 40,000 you'll get in 2024, 2025, 2026, and so on. But more or less, that's your difference. Um, the second half of depreciation is section 179. And 179 has been around for a long time. But with bonus depreciation, nobody paid attention to section 179 because Uncle Sam let you write off 100%, which was awesome. You got to buy an asset, write it all off. Fantastic. Um, there's a few limits for 179. Uh, one is for 2023, that expense is that you can write off is $1,160,000. There's a limit on how much equipment you can buy to qualify for that, and for 2023, that's $2.89 million. Then there's a taxable business limit as well that follows 179, which is why a lot of people just were happy to take bonus, which is great. This is an example of what 2022 would look like, and you'll see 2022 and 2023 are the exact same thing. Because it's 179, you buy the asset for 250, 179, you could claim the 250, but you're limited to $100,000. So basically, your income goes to zero. It doesn't go to the minus 150 that we saw in the bonus slide. So in the bonus, you got a loss of $150,000. In the depreciation under 179, your tax bill goes to zero. And you get a carry forward of 150. And you might say, well, big deal. It doesn't make a difference. Well, that might normally be true. But the problem is, is government, as usual with taxes, decides to make everything overly complicated. This year, you have a limit on the net operating loss. So that $150,000 net operating loss you can't use it all next year. You have an 80% limitation. Now, for farmers and ranchers, the loss, if you had a big year, you could carry that net operating loss back, which is great. Doesn't work for anybody else, but it works for farmers and ranchers. So here's net operating loss, and here's what happens. Let's assume in 2022, you had a half a million dollar loss. Your income in 2023 is also half a million dollars under scenario A. Your limitation is based off of 80% of the current year income. So if you lost a half a million this year and you have a half a million dollars income the following year, those two don't offset anymore. You're limited to 80%. So that means I lost a half a million in 22. 2023, I earn half a million. You'd think, great, I'm just net zero. I'm back to where I should be. That'd be cool, except for IRS doesn't really care. They're looking for revenue. So they capped that last year loss at 80%, which means in scenario A, you get to use 400,000, 80% of the current year 500. You have a $100,000 income, you're gonna pay tax on that 100. You have a $100,000 loss still, because it was 500 originally, you only got to use 400. But you're gonna pay tax on that 100. Scenario B, I tweaked the numbers just so you'd see how the difference works. Same half a million dollar loss, except 600,000 in scenario B. So your loss limitation is 480. Again, it's 80% of the current year loss, not the prior year. 80% of the current year income, not 80% of the prior year loss, excuse me. So in 2023, $600,000 income, $480,000 net operating loss, 
you got 120,000 of income you're paying tax on. Again, you still have 20,000 loss left, but you don't get to use it the next year because of the limitation. You'll see in C, because the income's at 750, 80% of 750 would be 600. Well, I have a loss of 500, so I'm basically sitting at 250. That's great. That hurts. And then a little tidbit they threw in that maybe caught a few people off guard is there's this excess business loss. There's a limit of 540 in 2022 and 578 in 2023. Any loss you generate greater than that in a particular year, so let's say you bought a million dollars of equipment and you only had a $100,000 profit because operating costs ran you high, you would have been capped at 540000 in 2022. So if you lost a million dollars, you couldn't have taken a million dollars. You would have been limited. So you kind of have to figure out, gee, how is this all working and why do I care? Well. You care because there are certain things you can do. Like I said, bonus is great. It allowed us to write everything off. The problem is, is if you generate a nice big loss and government limits that loss in the next year to 80%, then I'm kind of paying tax before I even, even got back to zero, which is a problem. If you took the $250,000 asset up there, and you'll see in column uh, under bonus, I could write off 80% in 2023, so 80% of 250 is 200. I get another $50,000 I get to depreciate. IRS tables yields me a $7,000 loss, so I have taxable income in 2023 of $107,000 loss. Assume 24, I didn't have any large purchases, and I make the same 100. I get my depreciation again, and then I get my net operating loss from 2023, but I'm limited to 80%. Bottom line, taxable income for 2024 is $18,000. I know it's math, it's IRS. If you look at the 179, you could take those same assets, split your depreciation up between section 179 and bonus, and 179 kicks in as a, as a taxable income limit. So effectively, instead of creating a $107,000 loss in 23 that I can't use all in 24, I could take 179 of 125 again, but I can't create a 179 to put me in a loss. So what happens with the 179? It automatically rolls to the next year no 80% limit. So you'll see under section 179 in 2024, I have $100,000 of income, I have depreciation of 3571, and my section 179 carry forward got me to a taxable income of zero. I pay no tax. I simply made an election between the two years of how I want to treat those assets. I bought the same equipment, bought the same animals, but I just made a choice between do I want bonus or do I want section 179. This is a bigger example with a little bit more money. Let's, instead of $100,000, let's say you're making a million dollars a year. You bought $2.5 million worth of assets. Add zeros in. It's the same calculation. I've just expanded it for ranchers that might have a larger income and they're thinking, well, it doesn't make a difference to me. It absolutely does. Because remember, I can use 1.1 million of section 179. If we took the same example here and split the depreciation up under bonus and section 179 for 2024 under the bonus column, we'd be at $185,000 of income versus zero under Section 179. So by just changing how you look at the assets and how your tax preparers categorize certain things, you can more or less change the way your taxes look. Now, again, depreciation is always over time. 
Whatever you don't take in one year, you get in the next year, generally speaking. But that net operating loss kind of hurts you. And you'll see under the bonus uh, category here, I'm going to use the screen, the 493 and the 493 over here, that's the excess business loss. So you have a million dollar loss. You can only use 578,000 of it. That excess gets treated not as a carry forward, but as a net operating loss, which has the same 80% limit. Now, if you happen to have another job, have another business, one's profitable, you're ranching, you run at a loss, and you're hoping to offset the two, you got a W-2, all that's great, but that million dollar loss is not gonna get you a million dollar deduction against your other income. You're gonna get capped at the 578 on the excess business loss first. So you automatically are gonna lose that 493 in 2023, it's going to 2024. So you might be able to manipulate by changing how you take 179 or bonus to allow you to use that loss and not have it restricted in 2023 and use it in 2024. Now, I know there's been a lot of discussions as well about R&D. Um, I've talked to a few different ranchers that have been looking at different feeds. They look at different grasses. They look at different methods. And for a long time, a lot of those have been able to take uh, research and development credits. And the beauty about a credit is it's a dollar for dollar deduction against your tax. It's not a reduction of income, it's a reduction of actual tax. For 2022, uh, Congress pulled a fast one though and said the R&D expenses that you incur that calculate the credit, we're going to make you capitalize those now over five years. So if you had in, you know, half a million dollars of R&D expenditures and you calculated a credit and you've been doing that all along, that half a million dollars you spent in 2022 or you spend in 2023 now has to be amortized over five years. And no matter what, the first year, you only get half a year. So if you spent half a million dollars on R&D, you'd get a $50,000 deduction in 2023. Now, that's painful if a lot of your R&D is hard cost feed, hard cost labor, you pay the labor out. The cash is gone and Uncle Sam has now restricted you on that R&D to where you can only write off 10%. So if you have or have been using R&D credit, you might wanna take a harder look at that, quite frankly, and consider maybe I need to not be so R&D intensive because of that capital restriction and the disallowance of that deduction. Now, according to individuals I've talked to in Washington, DC, Congress passed the law, didn't realize what this was really going to do, didn't understand that this was basically gonna penalize people for paying their employees and then not allow them to deduct that. Um, that is going to change, but unfortunately, Congress is a little bit dysfunctional. I don't think they're gonna do anything fast. Um, so just be careful of that. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak and uh, I'll turn it back over to Brian. Thank you, sir. Thank you, appreciate that. He did say we have a lot going on, but he failed to mention the test on all of that that we're gonna be conducting before anyone's allowed to leave. So the, um, the moral of the story that I, I guess I would summarize Steve just offered is that if, if you want to save money on your taxes, find someone that's really smart that knows how to do it, and that's what he's great at. So again, I would encourage you to reach out to him.